Hi, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here. I also promised my parents are actually not that proud. Um, <laughs> so as she mentioned, um, I used to be a violinist, and I sustained a really serious hand injury when I was 17. Uh, that was deemed by doctors to be a career-ending diagnosis. And so, as you can imagine, I was pretty demoralized uh, by the situation and also deeply concerned that I was never going to find something that I loved as much as violin. And then, fortunately for me, uh, one summer, I was helping my parents clean their basement, as any good daughter does. Uh, and I stumbled across a book called The Language Instinct by a psychologist named Steven Pinker. And I was instantly mesmerized by the topics that I was reading about. It articulated how something that had been so effortless for me and just about everybody else, namely our ability to learn and comprehend and speak language, was actually the result of extremely complicated, sophisticated cognitive architecture and machinery. And I remember thinking, wow, I never really even thought about my capacity for language, right? It's just something that just came so effortlessly to me, it's so intuitive. And yet, scientists over the years have discovered such fascinating and surprising findings about language acquisition. And this is what propelled me to study cognitive science over the last 15 years, just a fascination about how the mind works, right? And I ultimately landed in a particular sector of my field, decision science, and have been working to figure out applications of decision making. And when I learned about the science of decision making, uh, one of the things that I was uh, excited to learn is that it was just as surprising as all the insights I'd learned about language. Again, decision making feels so effortless and intuitive, right? I don't really think about it, but I'm making tens of thousands of decisions each and every day. And so what I'm hopeful today is that I can share with you some of the surprising things from my field. And you're all experts in this area, and I'm hoping that we can together try to forge some intersections between behavioral science and the problems and challenges that you're all trying to solve. So I wanted to open with a story first that can help articulate what I even mean when I talk about applied behavioral science. So back in 2015, I was working on veterans issues in the Obama White House. When veterans return back from their time overseas, they can face a lot of challenges, right? When it comes to finding work, getting back to school, et cetera. And so the federal government offers free job assistance programs and educational counseling to help veterans get the support that they need. But one thing that we found is that not enough veterans were signing up. We weren't quite sure why, so we had to do a behavioral analysis. And we had to try and devise a solution that kept us within the same budget that we were allocated initially. So we didn't have much breathing room. And ultimately, we ended up changing just one word in a marketing message to veterans about the program. Instead of telling veterans that they were eligible for the program, we simply reminded them that they had earned it through their years of service. And this one word change led to a 9% increase in access to the program, with the potential to positively impact millions of veterans around the country. Now, this example illustrates a principle called the endowment effect, which says that we value things more when we feel that we have earned them or own them. And this is one of many principles in the field of behavioral science that could potentially be relevant to the kinds of decisions that all of you make. So what act actually is behavioral science? It's the study of how and why we make the decisions that we do. And there's also research in the space telling us how we form our attitudes and beliefs about the world. So it's calling from research in psychology and from research in economics and is trying to blend the two fields to give us a more comprehensive understanding of our decision-making patterns. And the reason that we should care about this body of research is that it tells us that our decisions are actually pretty surprising. Our behaviors are very surprising. And they're often influenced by factors that we really ought to not be influenced by. So I'll give you two concrete examples. We like to think that when people go to the voting booth, they're going to vote for the person they'd most like to see elected into office. That's pretty straightforward, right? But research shows that the order in which the candidates' names appear on the ballot has a significant impact on voter behavior. 
In fact, in Texas, they found that when a candidate's name appeared first on the ballot, that candidate received 10 extra percentage points in vote share, which, as you know, is more than enough to turn any election, right? Another example of a surprising factor actually affects how we feel about one another. So there's research showing that when we're holding a warm beverage in our hands, we actually feel more warmly towards the people that we're interacting with. So there's this really interesting misattribution going on where we feel physical warmth and misinterpret it as being interpersonal warmth. At this point, I'd like to ask anyone with a iced beverage to kindly put it down for the <laughs> remainder of the talk. So as you can imagine, our field is ripe with these really compelling, fascinating insights. And so my goal after studying in academia for a long time was to figure out, OK, how do we forge intersections with the real world? How do we put these insights to work to make sure that we're solving real world challenges that are faced by real people? And so I brought this to the Obama White House, the glory days, um, <laughs> back in better times. <laughs> And our goal there was to build a team of dedicated behavioral scientists who could systematically look at different policy challenges and try and engineer solutions based on what behavioral science research says about those challenges. And what I learned from our experience working with lots of different departments, so Department of Education, as I mentioned, Department of Veterans Affairs, Health and Human Services, Department of Defense, is how universal the application of these principles really are. And it's particularly relevant for how we think about end-of-life care and decision-making. As you know, decisions are not made in a vacuum. So the choice architecture that we create for people, whether it's caregivers, providers, doctors, patients, really matters. It can have an outsized influence on the way that people are making decisions. How we plan for end-of-life, how we try to create human-centered solutions when it comes to easing caregiving and support and even how we try to minimize things like implicit bias. So today, what I'm going to do is talk about five behavioral science principles, just to help paint a colorful picture for you. There's many more where these come from, that I use time and time again during my time at the White House that I think is particularly relevant for the set of conversations that you've been having over the course of the day. So the first principle is called social identity priming. And what it says is that people tend to act in ways that are consistent with the identities that they either currently associate with or aspire to associate with. The Red Cross ran an experiment that leveraged this insight. They were sending letters to people who had previously donated to the Red Cross and were appealing to them and asking them whether they'd be willing to donate again. And they ran this A-B test, and what they found is that when they simply reminded the recipients of this letter that they had been previous donors, prime them for identity, for their identity as charitable, generous people with golden hearts, um, they found that that identity priming led to a 30% increase in charitable contributions. And impressively, priming people for their identity as donors actually made them more generous. It, they increased the magnitude of their charitable contributions relative to the previous year. Now, we use this insight in government as well. So for example, we were trying to support people who were unemployed, who were on unemployment insurance, trying to help them return to work and find jobs. And it's really important that we not refer to this population as claimants. We refer to them as job seekers. Similarly, when we were trying to create resources and handbooks for people that were leaving prison, important for us to call these population members of the community, people who are also searching for work these small changes in framing can have a huge impact. So in terms of the relevance for end-of-life care and decision-making, well, in the health ecosystem, there are lots of roles and identities that people occupy, right? And it's extremely important that we're thoughtful about the way in which we're labeling people, the way that we're talking to them and the way that we're talking about them because it may seem like it's just a subtle impact, but actually it can transform people's self-perception and the way they think about their own mental framework and the way that they end up making decisions. Ooh, sorry. Uh, the second principle is around user agency and control. So people really like being in the driver's seat. That's the takeaway here. 
And there's a whole research literature on the importance of maintaining agency in people's lives. But there's three particular principles that I wanted to communicate to you. The first is that when people actively choose something, they tend to like it more. So we choose the things we like, and then in turn, we like the things we've chosen more. And that's in part because we don't like having cognitive dissonance, right? And we like to think of ourselves as being really good decision makers. So when we decide something, we like to kind of pat ourselves a little bit on the back and be like, yeah, that's right. I made a great decision. So that's important for us to keep in mind because it shows that there's some greater investment, which leads me to my second point, which is that we do feel more invested in experiences that we've contributed to. So this is informally known as the IKEA effect, which says, you know, when you get the little box and it has 15 million pieces in it and you build this unsturdy stool that has to sit in your house for a long time, you still actually like it a little bit more. You might feel a little bit more affection towards the stool than something that came uh, pre-shipped. The third is that we predict better outcomes when we're in the driver's seat as compared to a process driven by others. In fact, there's really fascinating research showing that when people were allowed to tweak an algorithm even slightly, they were more satisfied with the results of the algorithm and actually opted to use that algorithm over other algorithms that they knew performed better but had not involved their input. So it's pretty irrational behavior, right? But it shows that there's some egocentricity here that matters. Like, we really value our own contributions. And so I think this really matters when it comes to end-of-life care and healthcare generally, because it's crucial that we help maintain people's sense of agency and control over their own healthcare experiences. And we have to ask ourselves, right, are doctors giving patients options? Are they allowed to choose? In the cases where options aren't available, do patients feel empowered to question the doctor's authority? Or do they feel empowered to give their inputs into what they would like their treatment plan to look like? This third principle is related, but still different from agency and choice. It's called operational transparency. And basically what it says is that when we pull the curtain back, even just a little bit, on the thought process behind the decisions that we're making, why it is that we came to a certain conclusion, what progress we're making towards a certain goal, it can really help to build trust in the people that we're communicating with. So the city of Boston took advantage of this insight. People were complaining about all the problems happening in the city. Oh, there's so many potholes. Oh, we have street signs that are all messed up. No one's fixing anything. The government's just this one big black box, right? And so what the city decided to do is actually just create a visual map online, a representation that just identified all the places where there were problems, right? Oh, there's a pothole here, I'm gonna mark it as blue, and then when we fix it, it's gonna to turn to green, let's say, right? Or, oh, there's a broken sign here. And remarkably, even though the city did not increase the speed with which they were making progress on any of these issues, it led to a 40% increase in trust in government, which was really important. And it actually made people a lot more civically minded than they were prior. And so that's really interesting because, again, same outcome metric, but you've pulled the curtain back, and all of a sudden people are more bought in. So I think you can already see the application to the types of work that you're all doing, right? Are we giving patients insight or caregivers insight into things like why the initial diagnosis was made, why treatment plan A was chosen over treatment plan B? Are we making sure that we understand how we've arrived at the conclusions that we've arrived at? Because if we do that, it's going to be a really effective way of building trust in the people that we are communicating with. And I think in the case of patients, if they feel like they've been privy to the thought process behind a treatment plan, they're more likely to adhere to it. And as we know, that can be a big challenge when it comes to encouraging well-being. The fourth principle is around the way that we construct memories. So this one's really interesting. I think intuitively think when we have an experience and we think about what that experience was like, every moment is an equal contribution to our overall memory of what the experience is like. But what research shows is that we apply disproportionate weight to the most intense moment of that experience. It can be positive or negative. 
and the end of the experience. So this is known as the peak end rule. And they ran this really fascinating experiment. In fact, this researcher went on to win the Nobel Prize in economics, where people's hands were plunged into a freezing bucket of ice water, okay, for 60 seconds. And then, uh, you know, this is randomized, but there's another condition in which people's hands are plunged into ice water for actually 90 seconds. 60 seconds of that time, their hands are plunged into ice water that's as cold as in condition one. And then for the 30 seconds after that, they increase the temperature of the water by just one degree Celsius. So let's look at the two conditions again, right? Condition A, you're in ice water for 60 seconds. Condition B, you're in ice water for 90 seconds, but the last 30 seconds are slightly less unpleasant. Now remarkably, when you ask people, which experience did you prefer? They, they actually prefer the 90 second one, right? Which is totally wild because the overall amount of discomfort, the overall duration of discomfort is a lot longer, right? And yet, the fact that you backed off the pain just a little bit for the, that last 30 seconds is disproportionately weighted in their memory construction. Now, the reason why this matters is because when we think about the way that we design different procedures, many of which can be really unpleasant, it's important that we take these insights into account, right? I don't want to get into any of the details, but they have done these tests when it comes to, say, colonoscopies. And those can be extremely unpleasant, but when you ease the end of the experience, people's memories are actually much better, and they're more likely to return for those important follow-up visits and for their annual exams. And so we want to be really thoughtful about accounting, again, for this insight when we're thinking of the design of procedures um, that are very important for patients to engage in but are not necessarily pleasant. And finally, this is one of my favorite ones, which is the power of the messenger. So this one's self-evident in terms of what it means, but what we find in behavioral research is that the messenger really, really matters. Now, there's a couple of examples of us testing this out in the White House context. So um, at the time, and unfortunately it's still the case, but there is a lead in water crisis in Flint, Michigan. And when this emergency uh, broke, the federal government was tasked with creating fact sheets around water safety to make sure that uh, important information got into the hands of Flint residents so they knew how to properly engage with their water in order for it to be safe for themselves and their families. And this was particularly important at the time because there was misinformation spreading. For example, some families were being told, oh, if you boil your water, then you're fine. Actually, that makes the situation a lot worse when it comes to lead, right? So together, we had worked on these fact sheets, making them comprehensive, making it very clear where they could get resources, et cetera. But that, there's that final mile problem, which is, well, who delivers this message? Now, typically, when the Environmental Protection Agency, which, is the, which are the folks that signed off on this fact sheet, put their seal on something, it carries a lot of legitimacy and weight, right? And so we put that seal on there. However, think about the context at the time. There had just been a huge breach of trust between the local government in Flint and Flint residents. So it was likely that there was going to be a spillover effect for the federal government and that they weren't necessarily going to trust us as the messenger. So what the EPA did instead is they mobilized canvassers within the Flint community. So folks from the Red Cross, from the local YMCA, from churches, people that they knew were trusted by residents in the Flint community. And they had them endorse the fact sheets. I mean, obviously they had, they looked at it, they reviewed it, make sure that they actually were behind it. And then they knocked on doors and they said, hey, look, I really care about you as a member of my community. Here's a fact sheet that will help you and your family stay safe. We also found that when we were trying to motivate low-income students to fill out the federal student aid form to try to get financial aid for college, um, these, these students were in the Department of Housing and Urban Development assisted housing units. And we had sent out letters initially, again, from the government agency. And then we convinced Michelle Obama in her office that maybe those postcards should come from her instead. And she shared a personal testimonial of her experience feeling a little bit like the underdog, not being sure whether she had what it took to go to Princeton, right? And as you can imagine, any, well, anything Michelle Obama touches turns to gold, but uh, in this particular case, it was extremely effective at motivating these students to sign up for the free application for federal student aid. 
So in the context of end of life, well, we need to be really thoughtful about who the messengers are, right? Um, I think that we know the messenger matters, but we might not appreciate just how much of an outsized influence it can have on the kinds of decisions people make. And I think most importantly, whether or not they're willing to make a decision, period. Because sometimes if you don't feel the psychological safety, it can actually deter you from making a decision altogether. And so I consider this to be one of the most important principles. So to summarize, uh, I think behavioral science can really help enhance policy design and can shed light on the way in which people are making end-of-life decisions and the way that we think of end-of-life care. Now again, I'm no expert in those particular areas, but I do think that behavioral science has a lot to offer. And I think it's especially important that we account for these insights that scientists have been gleaning over the years to make sure that when we are designing policies and programs, they're optimized with these insights in mind. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. Thanks.